Hi, Dr. Ken here with you. We're up to our final practice video for knowledge assessments T8 through to T15, this being part three of three. Just as a quick reminder, each question is made up of four slides. I pose the question or the problem. You then have to uh, pause the video while you have a go at answering it. Then I give you a opportunity for a hint, pause the video again while you try and answer if you weren't able to the first time, and then I give you the answer and an explanation around why it is the answer. So here's our first question for number three. 22, question 22, according to AS3000, the minimum size of a consumer mains neutral in a three-phase four-wire system is supplied with 25 millimeter squared active conductor. So what's the minimum size of the neutral? 50 millimeter squared, 25 millimeter squared, 16 millimeter squared, or equal to the line voltage. So pause here. So let's move on now to the hint. Uh, the hint's pretty straightforward. Just go and look up AS3000. Use the index at the back to look at neutral sizing. Won't take you too long to find the appropriate rule. So pause here. So the answer is 25 millimeter squared. AS3000 uh, clause 3.5.2 it must be no smaller than the largest active conductor so our active conductors were 25 square mil so it has to be at least 25 square mil or greater twenty three below is a three phase induction motor terminal box how would you connect the motor up in delta? So how would you connect this up in delta? So would you connect U1, V1, W1 are connected together? Or would you connect U2, V2, W2 connected? Or would you do U1 to W2, V1 to W2, V1 to V2? Or finally, W2. 2 to V1, U2 to W1, and V2 to U1. So pause here. So let's now move on to your hint. So draw the circuit diagram and label the terminals. And then think about how you would connect it together. So again, pause here if you haven't thought to draw out the circuit diagram for a delta. Label it and then look at your terminals. So the Correct connection would be uh, U1 to W2, V1 to U2, and W1 to V2. So uh, the terminals in a motor box are always set up like this to make it easy to connect. So it's just a matter of connecting a link through here and here, and then connecting up. A phase, B phase, and finally our C phase to the supply. That is how it's set up for the delta.
question 24, the variable power, or sorry, the available power, VA, from an open delta transformer is 57.7% of what? So the available power, VA, from an open delta transformer is 50% of what? A two-winding transformer, a three-winding transformer, a single winding transformer or a screened two winding transformer. So again, pause here while you think about it. Okay, let's move on and give you the hint. Have a look at uh, your practical on open delta. So in the practical workbook, and you did your prac on open delta, have a quick read through that. Okay, here's the answer. It's 57.7% of a three winding transformer. I quite often have uh, students get confused and they often go for this one here, two winding transformer, because an open delta does have two windings. That's very, very true. It only u or it only uses two windings, but it only has the effectiveness of 57% of a three winding transformer. So don't get confused between the two windings and the three windings. It's 57% of a three phase transformer that had three windings rather than an open delta, which only has two. And just before we move on, I might just quickly draw that. So you might have a open delta that looks like this it's got two windings but the full delta obviously has all three windings and this one is 57 percent of this one so 57 percent of this is what you get with the open delta. Question 25, an alternator below, you can see here drawn, has a line voltage of 240 volts and the phase impedance is 25 ohms. The reading what will the readings be on A1 and A2? Obviously they're in series, so they're ammeters, hence their names. So the question is, an alternator below has a line voltage of 240 volts. The load phase is 25 ohms per, and the readings, what will they be on A1 and A2? So pause here while you think about it, and do your calc. Okay, let's move on now to your hint. So redraw the circuit diagram of the load. So what I'm saying here is draw it as a what? Is it a delta? Is it a star? Think about um, how it's connected up and redraw it. It may bring the appropriate approach to mind. So let's now move on to the answer. 
So here's the answer. You have to first recognize that this is a delta load. So that's an important uh, aspect to understand. It is a delta load. So A2 here is measuring phase current and we are going to need the voltage line and the voltage phase are the same so it doesn't matter the 240 volts is both our voltage line and our voltage phase so 240 divided by 25 because that's the impedance is going to give us a phase current of 9.6 amps so A2 is going to read 9.6 amps we now need to find the line current which is what A1 is measuring and the line current is simply root 3 times 9.6 because there is that root 3 relationship between the two currents giving us 16.6 amps question 26 this time a delta connected induction motor below draws a line current of 32 amps from a 440 volt supply determine the current if the phase windings of the motor if fuse F2 blows so fuse F2 fails so determine the current in each phase so line current before the fuse blows 32 amps and we have a 440 volt supply so pause the video here while you do your calcs Okay, let's move on to your hint. So again, redraw the circuit delta diagram. This is going to very much help your mental modeling skills as you look at what the problem is and how to solve the problem. So let's now move on to the answer. So the answer is the calculate the phase current. Well, we can do that. So uh, we know that uh, I phase is going to be 32 divided by root 3. So that's 18.5. We know we have a 400 volts and C phase has gone open circuit and soon as C phase goes open circuit then all the root 3 relationships go out the window and we reduce to simple ohms law so we're going to get our 18.5 in B phase but we're only going to get current through the two parallel phases and we have to halve that so I'll just turn on my uh, pen so we have our full 18 and a half through here but we have this parallel path here it's still got the impedance but of course it's going to be half the current of what's going through the B phase 
So the other phases will have current. So it's simply 18.5 divided by 2. Let me just go back. So our 18.5 divided by 2 giving us 9.25 amps. So again, the understanding here is to make sure you do your calcs before our thing goes open circuit, but as soon as we lose a phase, we have to reduce to Ohm's law and understand that our delta is just becomes a series parallel circuit. So going on to question 27, a balanced star connected load has an impedance of 38.3 ohms supplied from a 415 volt three wire supply protected by HRC fuses. If C phase blows, what is the phase current in each phase? So this time it's balanced star connected load and each part of phase has 38.3 ohms impedance. So pause the video here while you do your calcs. Okay, let's have a look at the hint for this one. So the hint is draw the circuit diagram. You cannot do this in your head. So make sure you draw the circuit diagram. It's star connected, label the diagram with the information that you have and then work the problem. So pause here if you hadn't already thought to do that. So let's now move on to the answer. And you can see here I've uh, drawn the diagram. So here's a three phase star system. I've uh, labelled each of mine at 38.3. We've got 415 volts on two of the phases and zero volts on the third. So C phase is open circuit. Therefore, the current in that leg has to be zero. Remember, there are going to be no root three arrangements. Of course, there's only two phases, so we're going to have to default to Ohm's law. And if I have 415 volts across Z total of 38.3 times two, because I've got these two here, in series with each other. Therefore, I've got to add these two together, giving me a total of 76.6 ohms. And of course, the current through here, simple ohms law, the current through there is going to be 415 divided by our 76.6, giving me 5.42 amps through IA and IB. So effectively the current through here is now 5.42 amps. Moving now on to question 28, there is a three phase four wire balance load one watt meter is used to measure the power delivered. The reading is 2.8 kilowatts for the B phase. Determine the total power. So pause here while you have a go at this problem.
Okay, let's move on to the hint. So look on your formula sheet for power in a three-phase balance system. Nice and easy. This is just one straight off your formula sheet. So the secret here was it was three-phase four-wire balanced. So if it's balanced, we can just take the kilowatt reading for any of the phases and multiply it by three. So in this particular case, we're going to take our 2.8, multiply it by three, giving us 84 kilowatts. Question 29, examine the diagram below and answer the following questions. A, determine the total true power consumed when the watt meter reads 4.2 kilowatts. And B, what is the line current if the line voltage is 440 volts? Okay, so we'll pause here while you have a go at this one. Okay, time to give you a hint. So the hint is, is this a balanced system? You've got to ask yourself, is it balanced? And W is measuring the power in the phase. So there's two little hints you need to ask yourself. Is this balanced? And where is the power being measured? It's being measured in the phase. So we're measuring phase power. So pause here if you haven't thought about how you need to solve this problem. All right, let's continue on to the answer. So here's the answer. Three phase, so the power taken is simply the watt meter multiplied by three. So our Z's are all the same. They didn't tell us they were different Z's. So the Z's are all the same. So it's balanced. So it's a three phase balance. So we can take our 4.2 and multiply by three, giving us 12.6 kilowatts. It's a star load. So IP equals IL. The next thing we need to do is we need to find out the phase voltage. We know that the uh, watt meter gave us the, uh, the power per phase. I gave you that as part of the hint. We now need to need the voltage phase, the voltage just across any one phase. And that's simply going to be 440, because they told us that was the line voltage up here in the question. And divide that by root 3 gives us 254 volts is the volts phase. Now we know that the, um, the power per phase is equal to the current multiplied by the voltage per phase. And since we now have that, we can transpose the equation and we can say that the current is equal to the power in the phase divided by the voltage in the phase. That's why we needed both things. So we can simply take the power in the phase, which we were told was 4.2 kilowatts divided by 254 gives us 16 amps. And there's the second half of the answer. What is the current? The current is 16 amps. And the power, total power, was our 12.6 kilowatts. Question 30. A three-phase alternator supplies a full 
load of 132 amps at a power factor of 0.77 lag. If the line voltage is 600 volts, determine the apparent power and the true power. So we're after the apparent power and the true power. So pause here while you select the correct formulas and do the math. Okay, let's now move on to the pause hint. So check your textbook for three phase power equations or check your equation sheet. Either way, if you haven't already done so, pause here and do the calc. So here's the answers. The apparent power, apparent power is measured in volt amps, VA. So it's reasonably straightforward because it's root 3 for 3 phase volt amps. So root 3, 600 multiplied by 132 gives us 137.2 VA volt amps. I'll just get my pen up here because I think I've left the K off the front of that as well. So that will be KVA. The true power is measured in watts. And its true power is root 3 VA. And all we do is we're now going to multiply by the cos of the angle, the power factor. We were already given the power factor or the cos at 0.77 so really all we had to do was take the apparent power and multiply it by 0 0.77 giving us 98.4 kilowatts and you can do a little self check of course the kilowatts must always be smaller than the VA so if I was to draw a um, power triangle Remember that the uh, VA is the hypotenuse of the triangle and the watts is here. Therefore, the watts is always going to be smaller than the VA and the only time they're even going to come close to each other is if the power factor comes back so close to um, one or unity that the VA and the watts equal each other. But uh, by definition, kilowatts must always be smaller than VA. Nice, quick, easy way to check yourself. Okay, which phrase describes the earth fault loop path in an installation? So this is question 31 of the phrases below. Which phrase describes the earth fault loop path in an installation? And our choices are the path of the current from the supply to the load. Second option, the fault current path when a low impedance fault occurs between the active phase and earth. Option three, the neutral return circuit path. And finally, fault current path when a low impedance fault occurs between different active phases. So pause here while you have a think about which, fa which phrase fits. So time to move on to our hint. So 
pause here. My hint is go and look up AS3000 Appendix B. So go and have a look at the path in Appendix B and which phrase fits best. So pause here if you haven't thought to go and have a look in Appendix B of AS3000. Okay, the answer is the second one, fault current path with a low impedance fault occurs between the active conductor phase and earth, or the protective earth. So the path of the current from the supply to the load is incorrect. That's only part of the answer, so this one was incorrect. The neutral return path, well again it makes part of the circuit but not the total part, so that one was wrong. And the fault current path when the low impedance fault occurs between different phases, it's got nothing to do with a phase to phase fault. So that one can be eliminated. So we're up to question 32. When is it appropriate to use a low volume value, sorry, low value ohm meter to test earth fault loop impedance? When is it appropriate to use a low value ohm meter to test earth fault impedance. The four options we have got are when the current is not connected to the supply, when the circuit is connected to the supply, when the earth fault leakage current is zero, or all of the above. So I'll state those again. When the circuit is not connected to supply, when the circuit is connected to supply, when the earth fault leakage current is zero or maybe all of the above. So pause here while you have a think about what's the correct answer. So let's now move on to our hint. So refer back uh, to the, one of the teacher handouts you would have been given on use of an ohm meter to test earth fault loop impedance. A kind of bit of common sense here as well. So pause and have a think about it. So let's move on to the answer. Uh, the answer is when the circuit is not connected to the supply. Obviously, if you were to put an ohm meter across any part of a 240 volt supply while it's on, you're going to have some major problems. So first one was the correct one. When the circuit is connected to supply, no, you'll blow up your meter and probably yourself. Uh, when the earth fault leakage current is zero, it's got nothing to do with the trip of circuit breakers, and it's certainly not all of the above. So you'll need a copy of AS3008 for this. So using AS3008 to determine the AC resistance of the following conductors. We've got four millimeter square multi-core TPS V75 copper cable of a 60 meter length. And we've got another one which is six millimeter squared SDI V90 copper at 126 meter length. So can you determine the AC resistance of those conductors using your AS3000? So I'll pause here while you get your AS3000 and do the calc.
Okay, let's move on to the hint. So make sure you nominate the table and the column from AS3008. So once you've got your AS3008, you've got to think about what table number it is you're using and what column number you're using in your AS3008. So let's now move on to the answer. So for A, it's table 35, column 4, for multi-core TPSs. That's why it's table 34. Column 4 is for um, V75. And it tells us 5.61 ohms per thousand metres. So 60 metres, the AC resistance is going to be 5.61 divided by 1,000 multiplied by 60, giving us 0 0.337 ohms. Our second one uses table 34. Table 34 is for SDI, single double insulated cables. Again, column 5, because it's V90. It tells us that it's 3.93 ohms per thousand meters. So 126 meters of that will be 3.93 divided by a thousand multiplied by 126, giving us 0 0.495 ohms. So using the results from the previous question in question 33, what will be the earth fault loop impedance trip? Will it trip a 100 amp B type circuit breaker? So assume 220 volts AC supply and show all your working. So using the results from question 33, will the earth fault loop impedance trip a 100 amp B type circuit breaker? Assume 220 volts AC supply. So pause here while you nut that one out. Okay, here's your hint. Consult AS3000 Appendix B. Make sure you get the curve multiplier for a B-type circuit breaker. And what percentage of the supply voltage is allowed to be used according to Appendix B? So there's some very strong hints. So go to Appendix B. You need the curve multiplier for the circuit breaker and what percentage of the supply can be used. So hint, hint, hint. Pause here. And then we'll go on and look at the answer. Okay, it's time to go and look at the answer. So here's the answer. For A, a B-type circuit breaker must be multiplied by 4. So 4 times 100 is 400 amps is required to trip that circuit breaker instantaneously. So the fault current will be uh, 220 multiplied by 0.8. Remember we're allowed to use 80% of the supply voltage on the internal part of the installation. We divide that by 0.337 ohms that we got from our previous question and we're going to draw 500 and 22 amps so that is going to be more than 400 therefore the answer is yes it will trip the circuit breaker number b again b type circuit breaker times 4 400 amps is required our fault current will be 220 multiplied by 0 
divided by 0.495 this time much higher resistance and it's only going to pull 355 amps the circuit breaker will trip eventually but not instantaneously because 355 is obviously about 50 amps less than 400 so the answer for there would be no so that brings us to the end of part three again thanks for listening hope you've enjoyed the questions and uh, the answers and their explanations so i hope you've gained some improvement of your knowledge and skills around alternating current dr ken signing off